Good afternoon. Welcome to the second of Keating's procurement surgeries, where we inject a vaccine of analysis into the artery of ambiguity. Uh, before I introduce our panel and myself, um, it's been an exciting couple of weeks here at Keating Towers. Uh, we were delighted last week to be uh, recognized by the Lawyer magazine as their Chambers of the Year. Let me make way for this remarkable achievement, which is going to remain up there just in case you should forget. Uh, we're also very happy to welcome as our new Head of Chambers, Alex Nissen, QC, um, following the very successful incumbency of Marcus Taverner. Um, the Lawyer Award, <coughs> excuse me, is of course as much a tribute to our clerks and staff as to our barristers. Uh, speaking of whom, I'm delighted to introduce our panel, Smile and Wave panel, uh, Sarah Hannaford QC, Finulik McCready QC and Simon Taylor. Charlie Banner, who was with us last time, is off doing something glamorous in Sweden uh, and sends his regrets. Um, as before, we're going to start with a short presentation by each of our panelists uh, on a topic of current interest, uh, followed by an opportunity for you to submit questions um, on that topic through your Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can do so anonymously if you want. Um, and we will then move on to a number of other questions which have been submitted in advance. And a big thank you to uh, those who've taken the trouble to submit uh, some rather interesting questions. Um, my apologies in advance to anyone who asks a question and isn't answered because we are going to stick fairly rigidly to, to time uh, because I know that you will all by the end be gasping for that six o'clock G&T, uh, or nearly all anyway. Um, two points before we start. Um, at least one of our panelists is going to conduct a poll as part of her talk. Um, when the opportunity to vote pops up on your screen, do please vote. Votes are anonymous and we promise that all legal votes will be counted and no illegal votes. Um, <clears throat> also, please remember and observe the Chatham House rule. You're very welcome to quote anything you hear uh, during this uh, hour, but um, please don't attribute it to any one individual or organisation. And so to our three talks, um, a great many, if, if not most, procurement claims, I think it's fair to say, turn on showing what the authority actually did during its decision making process as compared with what it said it was going to do or, or should have done. Um, and that should, of course, all be recorded pursuant to Regulation 84 of the 2015 regulations. But is it? Fanula, over to you. And the others, please remember to stop your video. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about, as David said, record keeping, moderation and transparency. Um, just let's very quickly remind ourselves uh, what the obligations are under Regulation 84, apart from the procurement report. Um, it's seven and eight. Uh, contracting authorities shall document the progress of all procurement decisions, whether or not contracted by electronic means. Contracting authorities shall ensure that they keep sufficient documentation to justify decisions taken at all stages of the procurement procedure, such as documentation on communications with economic operators and internal deliberations, preparation of the procurement documents, dialogue or negotiation, if any, and selection and award of the contract. And the two that I've highlighted, A and D, seem to me to be particularly important in light of what I want to discuss today. Um, so what I'm going to do is have a very quick, really quick look at the law um, and then give you a set of hypothetical facts upon which I would like you to vote. Um, and then we'll have a very quick discussion. I have really only eight minutes to save the world and Dave is going to be very fierce about putting me through a metaphorical Zoom trap door. So um, let's uh, fasten your seatbelts and let's get going. Um, so uh, the first case I wanted to look at was Resource Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Court Service. Um, there, um, Mr. Justice McCloskey said that under the current statutory and jurisprudential regime, meetings of contract procurement evaluation panels are something considerably greater than merely formal events. They are solemn exercises of critical importance to economic operators and the public and must be designed, constructed and transacted in such a manner as to ensure that full effect is given to the overarching procurement rules and principles. So that's a solemn exercise of critical importance in a, in a moderation process. 
Then let's have a quick look at Lancashire, Lancashire Care and Lancashire County Council. Um, and there, uh, Mr Justice Stuart Smith, uh, ha finding the procurement wanting and striking the, the um, moderation, sorry, finding the moderation wanting and striking the procurement down because of it. He says, I look for the reasons why the council awarded the scores that they did, and I accept the submission that a procurement in which the contracting authority cannot explain why it awarded the scores which it did fails the most basic standard of transparency. And he went on to say, an authority is not generally under an obligation to disclose the notes of moderation. Pausing there, I think in most procurement cases with a um, standard of disclosure that's likely to be ordered, those notes are likely to be um, disclosed uh, um, under either standard, um, standard procurement or, or under any, any more um, nuanced order. Anyway, moving on, he then says, where, however, where the authority relies upon those notes as setting out the written reasons for the evaluator's decisions, it is to those notes that the authority, that, sorry, the court must look um, for the reasons and reasoning adopted by the authority. And, and what he said about the notes in that case is they did not provide a full, transparent or fair summary of the discussions that led to the consensus scores sufficient to enable the trust to defend their rights or the court to discharge its supervisory jurisdiction. He said first there was evidence which he accepted that there were other reasons which were in play and were not reflected in the scores and secondly pervasively there is no or no sufficient account of the reasoning and reasons that led panel members to resolve their differences if they did so as to arrive at consensus scores. So um, moving back from England to uh, Ireland but to Southern Ireland um, I want to just take you finally to the word perfect case, word perfect translation and the Minister for Public Expenditure. Um, that was in the Court of Appeal there. Um, and there the judge said, in the High Court, Barrett J rejected the argument that the evaluators were required to explain the progression of marks as between the various evaluation meetings. I think he was perfectly correct in so holding. As he put it, the test of manifest error is a ground of objection targeted ultimately at an impugned decision, not at the notes of the meetings which precede the making of such a decision. And that mattered there because um, the challenger had actually won at an earlier version of the scores uh, and then the roles reversed um, fairly markedly. Um, he went on to say in Word Perfect, um, he said, importantly, evaluators should have the freedom to explore, to consider and reflect on the strengths and weaknesses of the various tenders. And that the evaluators must be prepared to stand or fall by a review of the final published evaluation for manifest error. But short of that, they cannot be expected to have to defend what are at best tentative or provisional views expressed during the course of evaluation process. And he says, I would accordingly reject Word Perfect's appeal under this heading. So there we are, we have three cases. Um, that's one of a selection, but I chose um, polarized views um, for, for us to look at. And here are some hypothetical facts. So uh, there is a procurement and um, individual evaluators evaluate the bids they assign scores and they provide written reasons for those scores. A moderation meeting is then held and it takes, one. Well, we're not quite sure, but we, it less than two hours, definitely. And it's a, a, a big procurement worth tens of millions of pounds and, and running for a number of years. And um, at that meeting, moderated scores are awarded, which result in changes to about half the scores, some up, some down for um, both the winner and the challenger. There are no minutes taken at that meeting at all, save for some manuscript notes, which the procurement lead took, but they were subsequently destroyed. Um, and uh, the only record of it were the, the, as they were called, the moderated final scores. The procurement lead then drafted reasons for the scores, and it took 10 days for the reasons for the winning bidder to be produced for a draft of the reasons for the winning bidder to be produced and 21 days to draft reasons for the scores awarded to the challenger. The other evaluators were sent copies of those reasons um, and they were asked to review the drafts but they there were no records of any review, um, any manuscript notes that were resulted were all destroyed. So all that the court had to review the lawfulness of the procurement were the reasons produced um, by the uh, procurement lead. Um, and the contracting authority denies that there are any flaws in the record keeping or the integrity of the moderation process. 
Um, so what I'd like to ask in our poll is, do we think that the court is likely to uphold the lawfulness of the moderation process and or the record keeping? Um, could I just ask you all to vote um, while I um, have a discussion about it? Um, I'm seeing I've got to myself vote. Um, so that's that, that's the question. So that we've got um, we've got a, a two thirds ish a one um, one third split. Uh, Thirty two percent think it is the court is likely to uphold the lawfulness of the moderation process and all the record keeping, and sixty eight percent think that um, the court will not uphold the lawfulness of the moderation process and all the record keeping. And, and um, although 68% is a significant ma majority, uh, I guess that shows why, why we have litigation because 32% is a, is a, you know, a, a pretty good um, risk for uh, the challenger in that case. Well, I can't move forward. Well, in any event, um, let me just talk to you about what, um, what my view was. I thought that on the basis of Lancashire um, and on the specific facts of that case, the court was likely to find that what the contracting authority produced was not a sufficient account of the reasoning and reasons that led panel members to resolve their differences to arrive at, so as to arrive at consensus scores, because it was one evaluator's account of what had transpired many days after the meeting itself. However, one could see that on the basis of the, of the word perfect decision, it might well do, uh, depending on how the evidence came out, because that um, represented what the panel had decided. They, if the panel were all prepared to sign up for that in, in evidence, um, then they, uh, the court might well say, well, we've looked at the reasons, we've heard the evidence, and that is sufficient. Um, however, uh, just in conclusion, I think what I would um, want to share with you all is that we still see many cases where procurement decisions are either not documented at all or they're documented very poorly. Um, we know that the English courts are very suspicious of an absence of records in procurement cases. Just look at energy solutions, look at Lancashire and look at the geodesign case. Um, and whatever the future is for procurement law, um, and we still don't know what's going to happen at the end of this year, under domestic law, um, discretion has to be exercised rationally according to principle and on a proportionate basis and records of score, scoring individual scores and of moderation meetings should demonstrate that and in their absence a contracting authority is in my, my view taking a significant risk. Um, David, um, thank you very much. Thank you Fanula. So extraordinarily comprehensive uh, gallop through the uh, the dilemmas and, and, and the law. I have to say, having been on the losing side in one of the cases you mentioned, um, with a very indignant client who, who assured me that they had done a very thorough evaluation and the fact that all the uh, uh, notes and scores were written on the back of one envelope um, had was nothing to do with the case. Um, I, I, I do know how both sides feel that the evaluators who f fail to keep proper records uh, and the um, aggrieved challenger. Uh, so I think it is really something which has to be impressed on clients because in a sense, how difficult can it be to keep a record of what you've done? It can be difficult to do the right thing sometimes, uh, especially if it ends up with a contractor you didn't want, um, but um, just keeping records really shouldn't be beyond the wit of uh, procurement officials. Um, our, our next talk, um, I'm sure you all, uh, like me, just can't get enough of, uh, uh, of Brexit. Um, uh, can I invite my colleagues to, to put themselves on the screen again for a moment? Uh, that's it, beautiful. Um, and um, uh, sorry, when I said my colleagues, I should have said Simon, the rest of you can go back to sleep. Um, and um, so, um, yes, we can't get, you can't get enough of Brexit, that was the joke. And uh, Simon is going to entertain us with a short introduction to the recently published Draft Public Procurement Amendment EU Exit Regulations. Simon. Yes, indeed. So just, just as the, uh, the Brexit trade negotiations have been moving at a, a heady speed towards Mr. Johnson's oven-baked deal, so the, uh, the legislators have, have graced us with some draft regulations. 
So all is suddenly becoming clear as to what will happen at the end of the year. Well, maybe, maybe not. But, but what we do have now is at least a, a couple of draft sets of regulations to look at. And, and it seems kind of likely that with or without a Brexit deal, these regulations will define what's going to happen from 1st of January. Later, the, 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 as I'll come on to explain, is, is a much more debatable subject. But so it's worth it's worth focusing on these. And these have been these have been laid before Parliament very recently in the, in the last few weeks. And I'm going to talk firstly about the the draft um, the draft public procurement amendment, etc. EU exit regulations 2020. And I'll give. I'll give those the, the catchy title of the procurement exit regulations. So those are brought before Parliament on the 7th of October. There, there hasn't been uh, a decision yet on, on, on their adoption. So what, what do they do? Well, firstly, you may recall that there were some previous regulations dubbed the No Deal Brexit regulations that were introduced in May 2019 which uh, set out initially a process which would happen following exit day, which, which, was, which was then, I, I think, at the end of 2019, or, or maybe September 2019. And then the, the, there was later the Withdrawal Agreement and the, the European Union Withdrawal Act 2020, which reflected the, the later agreement reached after after Mr. Johnson uh, took over. So they, there was then a sort of an extension, uh, as you'll recall, for, for an implementation period, a, a transition period, which would last until the end of 2020. And we're, we're, we're obviously rapidly approaching the end of that transition period. So the question is, what happens from January 2021? So, the, uh, the procurement exit regulations, what they do is they, it, under, the, under the terms of the, the, the European Union Withdrawal Act, they address the deficiencies that, that are inherent in, in, in incorporating the, the EU procurement regulations as they are. So the sorts of deficiencies that they've addressed are, for example, the publication or, of an advert in the OGU notice. So that is now going to be in in the uh, in contracts finder and and tender for Wales the equivalent the, the, the equivalent publications in relation to the devolved administrations. The the other the other source of change that these are introducing are are the, th the thresholds. So some thresholds have been set, which are remarkably similar to the to the European thresholds. The, and they will then be set on a biannual basis by the cabinet office minister rather than. The European Commission by by the adoption of regulations. Then there are there are other other deficiencies, like for example the the reporting obligation that Fanula has been talking to. The the reporting of records would be to the Cabinet Office rather than the European Commission. In in for example the abnormally low tender rules, the the, the rule that that you can reject where there is state aid has been been removed. So there there are lots of lots of details uh, on, on addressing deficiencies and by the way the, these these regulations are applicable to to the utilities regime as well as the uh, as well as the, the concessions regime they they don't apply to the defense regulations there is a separate draft separate draft regulation in in, in relation to defense but more importantly what what do they do in terms of what's going to happen at the end of of this transition period so this is regulation 89 and 90 of, of the, the public contract regulations. And what, and what the, the, the exit regulations do here is that in the first 12 months, so, so throughout 2021, there is effectively another transition period because what, what it seems is going to happen is that the, the, the rights of operators from, from, from GPA countries with whom the, the EU has a, a, a relevant uh, GPA agreement. So where the type of contract being procured is subject, is, is within the, the remit of a schedule within the, the, the EU GPA agreement. 
uh, so so those sort of operators would would be would have rights under the regulations, and then EU operators also would have rights under the regulations if it's in relation to the sort of contract that is covered by a GPA schedule that is entered into by the European Union. So that's all very complicated, but it's actually it's actually what the, the current regulation 89 does anyway. It's, it's effectively just the status quo for one more year. However, at the end of the year, the, the, the position changes. And this, this is the, uh, the, the, the regulation 90 point. So at the end of the year, the only economic operators who would be able to invoke rights under the, under the regulations would be UK and Gibraltar economic operators. Now, the idea of this is that in the next 12 months, the, um, the, the, the international trade negotiators, of which we have plenty, obviously are going to, to do all these deals with, with, with other GPA countries, gain accession to the GPA, secure the schedules, and by the end of the 12 month period, we will have an oven baked set of rules that, that are, gives us reciprocal access to, to other GPA uh, countries' procurement regimes. And when that happens, then, then the economic operators from those GPA countries will have reciprocal rights. So that, that, that is the way it's designed, it's the des designed to work. That obviously there will be more amendments needed in the course of, of 2021. There are also transitional um, arrangements in relation to procurements and frameworks that have been commenced prior to the end of the, uh, the transition period. Now, just finally, because I've been given a one minute warning, there is another set of regulations which you need to have regard to, which has also been, been put before Parliament in, in October. And the, I won't go through them, but these are the regulations. The European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 retained EU case law regulations, very important, because what these relate to is, are, are the sorts of courts that will be able to move away, move away from from EU jurisprudence, which has been established up to the, uh, the end of the transition period. And whereas previously that was just the Supreme Court, now it's also going to be the Court of Appeal in addition to a number of others. So what, what that may mean is possibly more appeals to the Court of Appeal, less business perhaps for the Supreme Court, but, but more for the Court of Appeal. So on that note, I will, I will end, David. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> Admirably concise, 52 pages of regulations of amendments uh, in, in rather just under eight minutes. Well done. Um, I think it's, it's one, one observation that I'd, I'd add, and I wonder what, what you think about this, is that we've all sort of grown used to, and most of us have probably have grown up with, as it were, as lawyers, a single unified set of rules around public procurement, the EU rules. Uh, but um, the government in, in, I think it was June this year, announced that it intended to join the, uh, what's now called the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, not just the TPP anymore since Donald Trump withdrew. Um, and uh, that will probably bring its own uh, uh, rules that don't directly, they won't be procurement rules, but they will govern the way governments procure uh, and they may well set limits on state subsidies and so forth. So I think we're probably all gonna have to get used to working with an a rather more complicated environment, um, which I'm sure we look forward to enormously. <laughs> I, th I think it could be all change again in the course of next year. That's the trouble. It's, it's, quite, it's quite difficult to know exactly where we end up. But I think with these draft regulations, it looks as if there's, we've got at least another year of the, of the status quo. So our procurement careers are not over yet. <laughs> right. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Um, our last uh, Bijou lecturette, um, is going to be presented by Sarah Hannaford QC, who is going to talk about uh, some aspects at any rate of preparing for a procurement trial. Sarah. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> I've just had the privilege of uh, doing, or in one case almost doing, uh, two trials in front of Mr Justice Fraser. So I thought I would reflect on a couple of issues that arise in procurement trials. First of all, evidence, and secondly, confidentiality, if I can fit that into my eight minute slot. So on evidence, the first question I wanted to reflect on is, what evidence should you put 
forward in a procurement case, firstly as a claimant and secondly as a defendant. Starting with a claimant, I think there are five points to think about if you're a claimant. There are three preliminary points to bear in mind. Firstly, a procurement claim is usually about the defendant's evaluation, not about the claimant. Secondly, as a claimant, you don't want your witnesses to be destroyed in cross-examination before you have a go at cross-examining the defendant's witnesses. And thirdly, your case is usually much stronger before your witnesses give evidence than it is afterwards. So that's the three initial points to bear in mind. They all suggest not so much evidence, I think. The fourth point uh, I, to consider, and this is a legal point, is that a claimant's evidence is generally irrelevant to the meaning of the tender documents. And that point enables me to refer to and even read from my favourite case of all time. So see who can guess this one first. This is how this case starts. The Clapham omnibus has many passengers. The most venerable is the reasonable man who was born during the reign of Victoria, but remains in vigorous health. Amongst the other passengers are the right thinking member of society, familiar from the law of defamation, the officious bystander, the reasonable parent, the reasonable landlord, and the fair-minded and informed observer, all of whom have had see season tickets for many years. In recent times, some additional passengers from the European Union have boarded the Clapham omnibus. This appeal is concerned with one of them, the reasonably well-informed and normally diligent tenderer. The Arwine tenderer, as he has been referred to in these proceedings, was born in Luxembourg. He may soon be about to leave the Clapham omnibus, but uh, who knows? Anyway, I'm sure you've all worked out that that was uh, the beginning of healthcare at home in the Supreme Court. Uh, but what that case goes on to say, as I'm sure you all know, is that deciding what an R1 tenderer would have thought is a question for the court to decide objectively, and that evidence of a claimant uh, is irrelevant. It can't put itself forward as uh, an R1 tenderer because that is an objective test. The Supreme Court did accept, of course, that a court might need technical terms explained to it, and it might need to know the circumstances uh, of the terms or industry in question. But otherwise, the legal point to bear in mind if you're a claimant is that evidence on uh, what the tender documents mean is likely to be irrelevant. So that's the fourth point. The fifth point from a claimant's point of view is a tactical one, avoid annoying the judge. There is little in my experience that annoys judges more than having witnesses provide a commentary or submissions on the other side's evidence. So you add all those five points together uh, and I think you get to the situation as a claimant where you might be wanting not to put very much evidence in. What about if you're a defendant? What points do you have to bear in mind if you're a defendant when preparing for evidence at trial? The defendant's position, I think, is much more difficult in a procurement claim. There are two irreconcilable considerations. Firstly, cases are usually much stronger before your witnesses give evidence than they are afterwards. And secondly, you are likely to be criticised if you don't call, firstly, all the relevant evaluators. Secondly, some at least of the moderators and thirdly, those involved in the governance decisions. And fourthly, everyone who is still alive and well, who was mentioned in the pleadings and hasn't gone to work subsequently either for the other side or the winning bidder. Now, those two considerations are generally uh, and completely irreconcilable, I think. So what is the answer? The answer I think has to be that point two, consideration two trumps consideration one, you must, as a defendant, call all the relevant people. So that, that was a whirlwind tour of factual evidence. What about expert evidence? Now, we all know, I think by now, that expert evidence isn't usually considered relevant or helpful by judges in procurement cases, and that trend started with BY developments a few years ago. But what do you do if you're the defendant 
and you had input in the evaluation from someone with expertise uh, when he was carrying out the evaluation, can you call that witness to give factual and expert evidence? Or um, is that not allowed because that witness would be an expert? And if you're a claimant and you know that the defendant had expert input into the evaluation and therefore you're going to be rather um, at a disadvantage at trial, how do you counter it? Well, my experience recently uh, amounts to about this. The answer, if you're a defendant, is to call the evidence anyway and hope that no, one's a, no one objects. And you can probably, if you're a defendant, rely on the rather different case or, or the case the case of multiplex and Cleveland Bridge and the rather different situation, not procurement related, of uh, the TCC saying, well, in the in TCC cases, you can call expert from a factual, you can call evidence from a factual witness who can express technical and expert opinions as well, provided they're reasonably related to the facts within his knowledge and experience. So that's what you can uh, at least have a go at doing if you're a defendant. Um, the answer from a recent uh, trial I was involved in, if you're the claimant, appears to be that you put in a statement from an expert, you call it a factual witness statement, it is in fact an expert uh, statement and you hope that no one objects. And if there's an expedited trial on foot, probably no one has any time to object. Anyway, it's an interesting question. Those are the answers I've come up with so far on expert evidence. And if I've got couple of minutes left, I was going to say the, the other topic uh, to think about in preparation for trial is what to do about confidentiality. Um, I'm raising this really as a discussion point rather than giving an answer to it. But the conundrum is this, pre-trial, as we all know, the defendant's documents are likely to be very heavily redacted because of the winning bidder, sometimes more than one winning bidder. And the claimant is likely to be lucky to have agreed one client representative in the confidentiality ring. But my recent experience suggests that at trial, things are likely to change. Firstly, you will be entitled to at least one client representative in the ring. Mr. Justice Fraser made that uh, pretty clear in SRCL, I think. But there are three other points I think to bear in mind, particularly if you're the defendant. Firstly, Judges, understandably, want to hear trials as much as possible in open court, so they're not that keen on secret documents. Secondly, judges think that most claims for confidentiality are not justified. And thirdly, judges, just like the rest of us, but with more power to object, don't like reading documents which are almost indecipherable because too much of them is blacked out. So those are the points to bear in mind, <coughs> what's the answer? Because you've still got the winning bidder saying all his information is very confidential. Um, but I think inevitably the answer is to have a different regime for trial. Uh, you've got two choices there. Either firstly, you agree in advance, or secondly, you have it imposed on you incrementally by an increasingly cross judge to avoid crossness my recommendation would be the first option, agree a different regime in advance. Uh, but I accept that obviously, uh, given objections by winning bidders, one normally falls back on the second option. Uh, those are my thoughts on preparation for trial. David hasn't stopped me, so it sounds like I haven't even reached my eight minutes. Or perhaps you weren't reading my dire warnings. Um. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. It's often struck me, actually, how little attention is paid to the, the sharp end of procurement law in, in talks and lectures and, and so forth. And I think it's, uh, it's helpful and refreshing to hear some of those very practical considerations about the way you structure your approach to a trial. Um, just before we move to our, uh, our pre-submitted questions, can I invite the panel to join us again? Um, and we have a, a, a live question arising from Simon's talk, uh, which I will read out. Simon, on your reading of the EU Withdrawal Act as amended, do you think that previous EU case law on the procurement directives will be treated as retained EU case law, binding on lower courts under section six, 
even though the directives are not retained, could the cases be treated as relevant to the retained implementing regulations, e.g. the PCR? It's a, it's a, it's a good question. The, um, I mean, the, the, difficulty, the, the difficulty is that a lot of the case law is about general principles, isn't it? It's about EU principles rather than the specific interpretation of, of the directives. But is there a case for arguing that, that a case on jurisprudence on the specific interpretation of a directive is not retained law, possibly? I, I'm not sure. It'd be, it'd be great if I could hear the views of the person who asked the question, actually, on this one. <laughs> yeah, well, um, absent that, I'll, um, I'll chip in my view at any rate, which is that whatever the technical position, I think it would be very odd for a court to exclude from its deliberations uh, the principles and the jurisprudence that underlie the law that it's considering and applying, um, even if they're not <clears throat> required to do so. Uh, I, I'm going to confess that I don't remember the exact wording of the relevant section, but I don't think that they're <clears throat> excluded from taking those sorts of matters into account any more than they're excluded from taking into account jurisprudence from the United States or Canada or, or the Republic of Ireland, for example. It would seem to me very odd if you couldn't apply to the interpretation of uh, law about procurement, which was essentially predicated on the directives, uh, uh, law that had been made in cases on the directives. But I, I agree, it's not an open and shut. You can't give a simple yes or no. Um, in order to have some, um, oh, well, you, you wanted to, to hear from the question, and now we do. I think the case could be made under section six, though a strict reading may go the other way. Where have we heard that before? I expect UK courts would have regard to this case, or in any event, they have that option, even if not bound, which I think is pretty much what we've just said, isn't it? Uh, so there seems to be a broad consensus. Um, in order to have any chance at all of, of finishing in time for um, biscuits and tea, um, <clears throat> uh, I'm now regretting my earlier reference to gin, um, the, uh, we'd better press on. Um, and um, we, we have some questions to answer, as I say. Uh, the first of which is for you, Simon. But do feel free to chip in, Sarah and Fenula, and indeed audience via the uh, Q&A uh, uh, box, um, or indeed the chat box. Uh, the first question, yes, it, it concerns a recent Advocate General's opinion in the case of Commission in Austria, which is C537-19. Um, in essence, this is on the question whether an agreement between a Viennese contracting authority and a contractor was in fact a lease, as Austria asserted, uh, and therefore exempt from the directive, or was it actually a public works contract? Simon, I know you've had a look at the AGO. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. The, it's the perennial problem, isn't it, of whether a development agreement, for example, is, is a public works contract where the, um, where the public authority has been all over the specifications and, and, and Want, wants the developer to, to build in a particular way. But this case is a little bit different to, to the classic sort of case, because as I understand it, this case related to a situation where the, the, um, the, the Austrian authority, uh, Wiener Wohen or something similar, needed, needed, a, needed a building and they, they looked around for, for, for a, a suitable site. They found the site and then they they, um, they entered into, a, into an arrangement, a contract for the building to be built with a view to them then becoming the tenant. So it's quite different to the normal situation where the, the public body is the landowner and they make available land to the developer, for example, for a regeneration scheme as in Faraday or to build a supermarket and a community center as in, as in Midlands Cooperative. This is a situation where the whole, the whole point of the of the construction is for the public body to be the tenant of the building. So I, I think it's that may explain why the Africa General doesn't doesn't talk about the um, the need under the test for pecuniary interest in Helmut Muller for there to be a, a, a binding contractual obligation. Because I think it was fairly obvious here that, that there was the there was a, a lease that would be entered into after after the construction of the building and and the, the public body couldn't get out of the lease. 
say the public body required the, the building to be built in a particular way to meet, meet its needs. So it was really a classic public works contract. Whereas Faraday is, is, much, more, is much more controversial, isn't it? That's a situation where you, you, can, argue it, you can argue it two ways. And the, the first instance court in Faraday said that where there's a right to walk away uh, as, a, as a developer, from from an arrangement and you don't have to build the thing in the way that the public body is specified then it isn't the public's work works contract and then the court of appeal said no if they're looking at the substance of the contract if that's what it's all about then, then it is but but then that's different to what what happened in midlands cooperative where where there was a commercial investment in buying the the option for for the lease and if you exercise the option then then you you had to build the building so this could be an example where post-Brexit the, um, the proportionality principle weighs in and, and, and the English courts take a more flexible line to, to regeneration projects because it, it is a bit, the Faraday scenario is a little bit odd, isn't it? Where, where you, you, you enter into a, into a commercial arrangement for regeneration purposes and you end up having to follow the public procurement rules. That's my view anyway. Sarah, do you want to comment on that? I think if I if I may chip in, it, it I think there's been a tension for for some years now, which is uh, very well summarised by the Advocate General's opinion in another case in uh, the Kingdom of Spain IAPs. It's normally called, which is an incredibly complicated arrangement they have in Spain for for land ownership where where a public authority wants to build something, uh, and in essence, the Advocate General said to the court, "Look, you better watch out because if you apply the procurement rules too strictly." then member states and, and local government in member states won't be able to get developers to do things for free. Uh, you know, in our case, Section 106 agreements and in other countries equivalent uh, mechanisms apply. And, and uh, I think it was Mengotzi, but I might be wrong about that. But the AG said, go easy. You know, uh, he said an, an over-functional interpretation, by which they mean literal interpretation, will mean that um, a lot of public good is lost where developers are no longer able or willing to carry out these developments because uh, they're going to be at risk of, of not getting to do the contract they've set up. Um, it's a it's a genuine genuine problem, I think, which sort of sits in in the legislation. Uh, and as you say, an interesting an interesting and difficult point. Um, we have another question, Fanula. Uh, I think you you're going to deal with this uh, about um, green procurement. I was summarising the question. It's from a purely legal perspective. What sorts of clauses should we as a profession be thinking about advising clients to add to contracts and how can we build green drafting into procurement? Oh. No. Oh. Okay, I had, some, oh. I had some really pretty slides, but um, I've given up on my slides because they're just too, too uncorked. You had the slide with the green wall, didn't you? That was lovely. Yeah. Yes, I did have the slide with the green wall. Um, and I'm so sorry I can't share it with you all, and it was pictures, and now we're just going to have to rely upon the good looks of the panel to keep you all interested for a little bit longer until it's time for tea and biscuits. So, um, the question, uh, thank you Jane, and I haven't, um, we haven't crossed paths for a very long time, but it was good to see your name. Uh, and I, I, I was going to go back to the, the, probably the, the case that, um, that made us all feel a bit more secure about this. Uh, and of course, time has moved on and it seems amazing that one would ever have worried that it wasn't possible to include um, environmental criteria. Um, so I'm going back to Helsinki and um, it's much more exciting than uh, where I am today and where we're all locked down in and Concordia bus. That was about procurement of public bus services in Helsinki. The ITT awarded points for the use of buses with nitrogen oxide emissions and noise levels below specified values. Um, that would that seems like a rather marvellous um, uh, social benefit, um, but there was the wrinkle that the only um, transport company that could under, make, make, meet the criteria happened to be the contracting authority's own. Um, in any event, despite that um, uh, um, awkward um, fact, the court held that it was lawful for a contracting authority to take environmental criteria into consideration, provided it was linked to the subject matter of the contract, provided it didn't confer an unrestricted freedom of choice on the contracting authority, that it was expressly mentioned in the tender documents and it was not discriminatory. Uh, and it certainly didn't confer an unrestricted freedom of choice on the contracting authority because they were very specific about the nitrogen levels and the noise levels that their buses could, um, 
uh, um, could meet. So um, your question is, is what really what should lawyers be drafting into contracts? Um, and my answer really is it's you need to go back to the very beginning and the client needs to decide at the outset what it wants and what it's prepared to pay for so that you can then draft them the contract that they want because obviously um, contractual authorities fall into terrible error if they change their mind halfway through. So the tender documents, which might include your draft contract, um, need to specify what the, the contracting authority's requirements are and then to provide to evaluate them in an objective and non-discriminatory way. I'm sorry if I'm teaching my grandmother to suck eggs, but it is really important to go back to the very beginning and say, what are we actually looking for here? Um, are we, what, what objective standard do we want people to um, uh, comply with? And what imaginative solutions do we want tenderers to come back with? Um, and then the draft contract, which you publish with the ITT, needs so far as possible to reflect those requirements. But of course, you also are likely to get, um, you may be looking for, innovative responses from um, bidders. So your contract needs to provide for um, those responses to be contractualized by appending them as schedules. Um, so that you, it, you then have um, an opportunity to contractualize what you want and to prevent the, the um, economic operator from then value engineering your, um, these marvelous solutions um, into, um, um, insignificance or, or to lose them all together. Um, and then of course, you've got to be able to monitor performance and to provide um, contractually for that, both that monitoring for the supply of the information you might need to monitor it and for sanctions um, if it uh, does not, uh, if the contractor is not complying. Um, so you asked for sort of what contract clauses. Um, I've just come up with some guidance and I'm sure we can circulate these slides afterwards because I've got some hypertext links in them and so on. So that the, um, there is guidance from Europe on buying green um, and uh, it's, on, it's in its third edition. And it talks about well, lots of interesting things and I commend it to you, um, to everybody in, to read it if you haven't. Um, chapter five talks about life, life cycle costing and allows you to expand um, the evaluation criteria to look much more widely um, at uh, the, how a project might, might be costed. And um, the PCR, of course, provides that contract award criteria may include life cycle costing as described in Regulation 68. Um, and that talks about um, costs borne by the contracting authority, such as costs relating to acquisition, costs of use, such as consumption of energy and other resources, maintenance costs, end of life costs, such as collection and recycling costs, um, costs imputed to environmental externalities linked to the product, service or works during its life cycle. Um, and that may include the cost of emissions of greenhouse gases during the life cycle, providing their monetary value can be determined and verified. So it's pretty broad. Um, and I think the, the chapter on life cycle um, costing in, in the um, Green hand, buying green handbook is useful for procurement lawyers to read. Um, and then in terms of specific contract clauses, uh, chapter six deals with that um, and deals with a sort of high level uh, what you need to do. In terms of more detailed guidance and, and what you might use, well, of course, um, BREAM, which is what I think we're all familiar with, an objective external standard for the assessment of sustainability for building. So you could use that as your objective guide. Um, I've also found something called RAP, which is guidance for low carbon building projects and estates management. And that does actually suggest um, some provisions for uh, construction contracts, but both for designers and for contractors. And as I say, we can circulate the slides with the, the link. And then I got terribly excited because I found a document, um, well, I found a series of documents called the Government Buying Standards for Construction. And, and I clicked through with huge enthusiasm, expecting very long document on um, buying standards for buildings. And it was um, a one page. Um, so um, uh, there's a hyperlink to those as well, but um, I, one has to hope that they're works in progress because they're really not terribly helpful um, in, in terms of uh, practical advice for people who are trying to do something to save our planet, um, which we know is, uh, you know, more than imminent, we're, we're sort of, two bars beyond the last chance saloon. Um, so that's my answer to um, uh, Jane's question. And I'll pass, I'll go back to you, David. David, you're on mute. 
Uh, sorry, that was me saying, no, I'm not pretending. Well, never mind. Um, yes, thank you, Fanula. That was, again, comprehensive and compressed. So, so well done. Uh, we're almost within time, which is, you know, not bad, I think. Um, we have a question um, uh, relating to um, the uh, question of record keeping, though, which I, if you can touch on it quickly, um, that Ooh. would be uh, that would be appreciated. Um, the, uh, the the question is: Do the panel have a view on the standards of record keeping the court will expect in the case of direct awards, uh, higher or lower standard compared to a normal procedure? You mean direct awards because of COVID nineteen? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, I've directed this to the wrong wrong panelist. And my my apologies, bad chairman. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I mean the, the question is um, is uh, if you're going to do a direct award, do you have to have even higher standards of record keeping? I think is, is what it comes down to. Sorry, I was going to jump yes. in and ask that. Yes. Well, the... <laughs> yes and no. Surely is the answer. Yes, if you're making a direct award. Uh, in ordinary times, but arguably, if you made a direct award in the middle of a pandemic, um, it might be excusable uh, to take into account the context and the circumstances, and you wouldn't be expected to be quite as um, careful as you would have been able to if you had a bit more time. Thank you. Um which segues neatly, beautifully even, into um, the question which I think, Sarah, you're going to address, um, which is uh, also the last for which we have time today. Uh, and just before you, you do your segue, I, I will just mention that um, Andrew Milros uh, has kindly um, let me know this. Um, the Chancery Lane project has come up with some green clauses. Uh, Andrew hasn't looked through them yet. Um, but he thinks that the issue for most clients will be monitoring compliance uh, and setting contractual consequences for breach, which of course is, you know, one can see is one of those problems where you can't necessarily, uh, you're not necessarily going to be able to say you've suffered loss if somebody doesn't uh, produce the green building they said they were going to produce uh, or whatever it is. But I'll, I'll leave that hanging. But thank you, Andrew, for drawing that to our attention. Um, Sarah is, is going to talk about uh, contract amendments uh, reflecting the pressures of the pandemic um, and the risks of agreeing such changes, particularly where it might be said that they alter the economic balance of the contract in the contractor's favour. Sarah. Uh, yes, I think the question was, um, what if you do during the course of a pandemic want to extend or expand an existing contract? Uh, can you do it? I think, I mean, as we all know, the, the, uh, in March, there was commission guidance and uh, cabinet office PPNs issued, making it clear, should it ever have been doubtful, that the directive and regulations are very flexible and that you can make direct awards uh, and extend contracts for COVID-19 related uh, procurements in appropriate cases. So that was all lovely, but that was then and this is now. Um, the PPN did deal with extending contracts uh, for um, COVID-19 related procurement or related issues, not just procurements, obviously. Um, and that would include the need to modify for unforeseeable circumstances. But as I say, that was then and this is now. In March, things might have been, and April and even May, things might have been unforeseeable, which now perhaps are not unforeseeable. Uh, on the contrary, one might now say it's very difficult to imagine living in any circumstances other than the midst of a pandemic. Um, and you have to apply that sort of thinking to whether now you could rely on something like unforeseeable circumstances to mean that you have to modify your contract. But if you could, uh, if you do think it's unforeseeable still, this second wave, then as we all know, under Regulation 72, you need to show that the need has been brought about by circumstances which a diligent authority couldn't have foreseen. It doesn't alter the overall nature of the contract and the increase in price doesn't exceed 50% of the value. So if you could fall within that provision, you don't need to worry 
about the question of the economic balance in the same way that you would need to worry about it if you were extending under the press text type uh, of extension in Regulation 72. But it, in my view at the moment, the question is really whether we can any longer say that we have to make direct awards or extend contracts because of COVID-19. Now, you can obviously think of some situations where you might have to. So, for example, if you had placed lawfully a COVID-19 contract during the first wave, you might now need to extend it uh, on the basis that you can't change contractor for economic and technical or technical reasons. But I do think you need to think very carefully about relying on these exceptions, particularly now that we're a bit further down the line. Uh, and obviously, picking up the point on records and reasons, don't forget that the PPM, despite saying it's all very flexible, still says that contracting authorities uh, must keep a written justification that they're satisfying any conditions they think are met for extending a contract. So that was a whirlwind tour, um, and we're just in time, David. And included the very cheerful thought that it's now impossible to imagine living other than in the midst of a pandemic, for which I'm sure we're all enormously grateful, Sarah, thank you. Uh, sadly, also probably true. Um, I think that concludes uh, everything that we, we um, set out to talk about. And uh, astonishingly, we have managed to finish on time, uh, for which I think we should get a whole nother award, really. Um, so it only remains for me to thank Sarah for Hannaford QC, Fanula McCready QC, and Simon Taylor for their diligent uh, addressing of, of the questions and the topics that we've been discussing today and to thank everybody who has attended uh, and uh, joined in with the poll, submitted a question or just uh, uh, listened um, and no doubt I hope uh, benefited from, from the uh, discussion. Um, I'll just briefly mention that if like me you can never, you're first to see Sarah and Fanula uh, in action, can never be wholly satisfied um, they are both speakers in the forthcoming White Paper Conference, uh, which will be um, uh, online on Friday, I think it is, uh, and then available for uh, a couple of weeks thereafter. Uh, so um, they will be among the speakers in that, uh, and um, uh, uh, they tend to be uh, pretty good value, I think. Um, I see that we have a couple of rather nice compliments uh, on, on the uh, surgery, for which I'm sure we're very appreciative. And with that, um, let's, uh, let's all go to our various refreshments. Thank you for coming. Thank you, David.